I'm Mark Bedore at McGurry Ranches in the mountains of Idaho, where you can experience the real deal cowboy life. We'll show you. Plus, recreating Western history at the Shiloh Sharps Rifle Company. And they are very period correct. We're the only company in the world whose parts interchange with the originals. And the custom boot maker to the working cowboy, Seth Tyker. And working cowboys, they'll spend money on saddles, on headgear for a horse, on boots. It's all next, today's Wild West. The Wild West, it's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. Chasing cows in the rugged mountains of Idaho. Wrestling calves at branding time. Welcome to the real deal cowboy life at McGarry Ranches in Rexburg, Idaho. Spend a week with the McGarry's. Gets kind of Western out here, doesn't it? It does. And you're guaranteed to work hard, get dirty, and live the life of a working cowboy. Everybody thinks we're crazy. But for Brooks and Beth May, it's the perfect vacation. That we come out here and we actually pay somebody to, to work on their, on their ranch. The Kentucky couple are here for the 10th time in the last eight years. It was love at first sight. People come from all over the country and all over the world to experience the real deal cowboy life at McGarry Ranches. It was very evident the very first day that this was no show. This was a real way of life. These were real cowboys and cowgirls. The McGarrys have been running cattle in this country ever since Henry McGarry first arrived here in the 1880s. Family patriarch Theron McGarry Henry's great-grandson opened up the ranch to guests about 25 years ago. And while McGarry's is a member of the Dude Ranchers Association, there's only one activity here. Do whatever it takes to keep the ranch running that day, from the back of a horse. So we don't get up every morning and think, oh gosh, we got guests, now how do we entertain them? We just get up, we got something to do, and they're going with us. This is Annie. Annie, hi Annie. Most days start the same way, saddling horses, Guests are up at 6, eat breakfast at 7, saddle at 8, load up the horse trailer, and head for the mountains, where the McGarry's run about 1,000 cow-calf pairs on 55,000 acres of ranching leases in the Caribou Targhee National Forest. That's about 100 miles southwest of Yellowstone National Park. Today's mission, track down a dozen cow-calf pairs, round them up, and vaccinate and brand the calves. But before we go looking for the cattle, we need to set up a branding corral. No corrals up here at all, so we just have to set up our own. It's no easy task, but everybody pitches in. And as usual, that includes Theron's extended family. Theron's son-in-law, right-hand man, and head wrangler Dirk Morton is joined by his daughter Courtney, her husband Kyle, and their son Carson, a future rodeo star who's already riding miniature bulls and winning buckles at the tender age of 12. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. You're probably the only bull rider in your class, I'll bet. Yep, I am. <laughs> I keep wanting him to rope more than he wants to ride bulls, but I can't seem to win in that category yet, so. <laughs> you like getting in and you know, kind of thinking like, I was just gonna end up, kind of. <laughs> yeah, we've told him if he's, if he's riding rough stock, though, he has to rope. He likes the bulls better. Yeah, right? he likes the bulls better. How do you feel about that? You know, I'm all right with it. We've kept him pretty safe, as safe as can be, you know, so yeah. far, but. Rodeo runs in the family. Dirk is a seven-time Idaho State bareback champion, and every one of his five kids have won their own saddles in rodeo competitions. The family's roping skills will come in handy today, but first we gotta find those cows. Bring them back to here. We'll go down and start gathering these right here and see what we got. Dirk and Kyle take the lead as we head out to search. Hey Kyle, did you guys go right or left where this fork is? Every rider's saddle is outfitted with a walkie-talkie to keep in touch in this rugged country. Courtney knows it well. She was barely out of her toddler years when she started coming up here with Grandpa. You kind of grew up out here with mm -hmm. Grandpa? Yep, yep, I did. Four or five, I'd probably say. Even before we could really ride, we'd go pack salt with Grandpa there and then ride the pack horse, you know, and sit on the 
gosh, I forget, like the tree of the saddle, and then we'd have the salt, you know, and our feet would just be on it, and yeah, it was fun, so. Today she still rides with granddad whenever she can, usually about once a week. Carson comes even more often, and other family members love to saddle up to help out whenever they can. People always comment how close our family is, that we, we're always doing a lot of things together. Well, you do stuff together because you're always doing something fun together. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we think it's fun, so. How many families get to go chase cows together? Right, yeah. Or have a rodeo star. Yeah. <laughs> they do everything together. Everybody goes to the mountain. Everybody pitches in when they brand. The family is a big part of the attraction for Beth and Brooks, who feel like they've been adopted. You know, we get very close. These people spend a lot of time here. Yeah. It's like they are motto is, you know, you come as guests and leave as family, and and I guess that's kind of the way it is, you know. It, it's easy to feel connected here. McGarry Ranches only takes 10 guests at a time, usually adults only, and you better like to ride. In fact, ranch guests spend so much time in the saddle, they're assigned two horses for the week, changing mounts every other day to give those hardworking animals the rest they need. Most every horse is a registered quarter horse, and the saddles and tack are top quality. A lot of them are handmade saddles. Stirrups are turned so that people's knees and ankles don't bother them, and we want them so that they're as comfortable as they can be. You get the equipment that's nice for them to ride, it helps immensely. We find most of the cows we're looking for, but one pair remains missing. No luck, Dirk, huh? I didn't even see a trap. They gotta be up there or in here somewhere, but I don't know where. We'll go brand the ones we got. Back at the corral, the air is soon filled with swinging lariats, the sound of bellowing cows, and the smell of burning hair as roping, dragging, and branding gets underway. Courtney won her saddle team roping, and we can all see why. I know, I have to show these boys how it's done sometimes, you know. <laughs> no, have a We're known. glad you do. We'll no. get done faster. <laughs> yep. Got it. This mother of four is a pretty good shot. Carson, Kyle, and Dirk get their share too. Hired hand Charlie Jones heads up the ground crew, throwing roped calves to the ground. Not an easy job. Beth applies the vaccine shot. Brooks jumps in too, as Theron handles the branding iron. Now I know people are gonna ask, why do you have to brand? Well, because we run a big open range and without that, there's no way to identify. We mix with other people's cattle and so in order to be able to prove ownership to them, you brand them. You can do as much or as little of this as you want, or just watch. It's what you make it. If you go home without a bruise or a scratch, you ain't had any fun. Finally, we get her done, at least as far as the branding goes. We still have to tear down the portable and very heavy corral gates, then load up the horses. You do that easy, huh? Yeah, <laughs> they're ready to go. They're tired for the day. <laughs> That's a good job to have done. If your idea of a vacation is a cool drink on a beach, this may not be your cup of tea, but Brooks and Beth wouldn't have it any other way. Got your vacations worth today, huh? Yes, got our money's worth today, there's no question. Whew. If you want to that's experience not, the real deal. That's it. That, that, it doesn't get, <laughs> doesn't get any more real than that. After a great day of chasing cows in the spectacular Idaho mountains, you'll return to your comfortable cabin here at Ranch Headquarters, where you can kick back for a few minutes before joining your new friends for a delicious home-cooked dinner. And trust me, you will sleep well. More to come tomorrow when we're back in the saddle for a cattle drive. Back in the saddle again along the picturesque Snake River. McGarry ranches began running cows in this national forest before it was national forest. But today they're careful to comply with the terms of their grazing permit, which requires the ranchers to be up here six days a week. Come on, let's go. Rotating their cows to different sections to make sure no one area gets overgrazed. That means rounding up the cattle and driving them miles away to new pasture. That's the job today. Where are we heading, Dirk? Woods Canyon. So with Dirk leading the way, rodeo star Carson is back for the ride, plus Brooks and Beth, and my wife Marilyn and I. What's the plan? I'll run down and grab these. Just hold them here. Okay. And we'll get them, and we'll go right back up the way we came. Obviously, this is not wide open prairie, and finding cattle in this rugged country and keeping them moving on the trail can be quite the challenge. But it doesn't take Dirk and Carson long to find their cows, 
and the head wrangler comes charging back at a gallop to cut off the leaders and keep his herd going in the right direction, which will not be easy. What are we doing? We're going to take him up this trail right here. Up! Hey, up! We're taking the cattle up a steep trail through thick woods while trying to keep them from escaping into the brush. And then Marilyn, go galloping after them. <laughs> That's where those cow dogs are in their keep, rousting cows from even the toughest hiding places. Always fun to watch those guys work. No denying this is tough country for cowboying, but what an office. This is beautiful land. And the cattle are good for it. Grazing keeps the brush down, keeping the forest healthy, and cutting down on the potential fuel for destructive wildfire. It's good for ranchers, too. There's plenty of grass and water for the cattle. However, what's worked for ranchers is a dream for many of the rest of us, living the cowboy life. And riding with the McGarry's is not just another trail ride. Badger, you're an awesome horse, buddy. Uh, we, we go up there to do something, you know, and uh, uh, we're either up moving cows or we're taking them off on place, changing pastures or kicking them off some ground. They're getting fed off a little too much, putting them in an area where there is more feed. And, and I think that is we go up there with a purpose, not just go up to kill the day to entertain the guests. You know, we go up there to, to accomplish something. Sometimes we don't get accomplished what we do the others. I've had several guests say one thing about it is challenging, and it is when you're handling cattle, cattle up in that kind of country we run in, it is challenging, you know. This is riding with a purpose, doing a job that has to be done, and that's a big attraction, even to serious horse people. I know a lot of them will say, boy, it's you're going to be going to ruin our trail riding at home because it'll be pretty dull there, you know. So For Brooks and Beth, coming to McGarry Ranches has been life-changing sold our house in the city and bought a small farm out in the country and bought a couple of horses and got some chickens and, and we thoroughly enjoy uh, getting out there and working on the farm and not getting caught up in, in a lot of the things that we used to get caught up in. There's no denying it's hard work and labor intensive, but it's also a big change of pace from life back home and sitting at a desk. It is fun to watch these guys work. Dirk is a real pro, and most of us will never be the cowboy Carson already is at the age of 12. But the fact is, guests like Brooks and Beth become a vital part of the operation. No, it's good to be on that trail down there. Okay. After coming here for years, they know the drill, know what to do, and get the job done. You take like Brooks and Beth, they're quite, the people that's been here kind of learn the country, you know, and, and we get a lot of people to have their own horses. You take them up here, like they say, we, we we can ride a little around home, but we can't ride and do the kind of things that we do up here. It takes all day. That's okay. The chance to spend hours in the saddle on a great horse in the American West is why we all came here. Trail's end. Finally, we reach our destination. The cows go through the gate, mission accomplished. Go home without a bruiser or a scratch, you ain't had any fun. <laughs> well, we've had a couple of those today, I guess. We've had fun today, and I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a most exciting day. <laughs> a true Western experience here today. Yeah. There's no question about that. <laughs> we ride back to the truck and head for home. Carson, you shoeing horses yet? Uh -uh. Carson's the right size because you don't have to bend over. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's family night back at the ranch. Theron's kids, grandkids, and great grandkids are here for a hot dog cookout. And like little Blaze, every single one of them seems to grow up with a rope in their hands. After more than 100 years, it doesn't look like the McGarry's are going to run out of cowboys anytime soon. Yeah, I think so. I don't think there's a problem. <laughs> and that's great news for guests like Brooks and Beth, who get to be part of the family and live their cowboy dream whenever they swing into the saddle at McGarry Ranches in Rexburg, Idaho. Coming up, you'll meet another Idaho cowboy who moonlights as a custom boot maker. But first, 
The Montana Company recreating the historic Sharps Buffalo Gun and they're surprising customers. Now we have one like it, which is this one right here. It's the big rifle that co-starred with Tom Selleck in Quigley Down Under, and it was made in the small town of Big Timber, Montana. Yeah, we did Quigley, um, we built for Dances with Wolves, Crossfire Trail, and Wyatt Earp. All of those guns were built from raw steel and wood at the Shiloh Sharps Rifle Company. For 40 years, family-owned Shiloh Sharps has been recreating the guns used by the buffalo hunters of the 1800s. And they are very period correct. We're the only company in the world whose parts interchange with the originals. And these prized rifles are coveted by buyers all over the world. People will like history and people like to compete. Some people hunt with them. Other people will hang them on the wall and never shoot them. The guns made here at Shiloh Sharps are exactly the same as the ones made back in the 1800s, like this 1874 model owned by famous frontier photographer L.A. Huffman. It's the exact same rifle you see in this historic photograph and one of several museum quality pieces displayed in the Shiloh showroom. So this is the foundry. But what most people yeah. never get to see is how these rifles are created. You have a master. From carved hardwood. We start out with virgin bars of 4140 chrome ollie. And molten steel. Pot here will melt 30 pounds of this every four and a half minutes. Kirk Bryan took time out of his very busy day to give us a fascinating tour of the factory, beginning in the foundry. Those will be grip caps. The parts are created with wax molds, the same process used when a bronze sculpture is cast. And these here are some butt plates. What you end up with is a piece of steel that looked like the ceramic tree. This is a 74 sharps receiver. Now these will get buzz cut off of here. These are the castings that we just seen next door. They'll be putting these CNC machines and come out looking like this. All the holes are drilled, threaded. Shiloh used reverse engineering to discover how the old guns were made to make historically accurate replicas. High-tech equipment is of course used today, but much of the meticulous craftsmanship is still done by hand. And here's what some people have. This one here's got gold inlay. There's a buffalo on this side, a wolf on that side. It's like a work of art. Mm-hmm. And that's all it? done by hand. Hammer and chisel. This is the woodwork. These accent lines, this is all hand filed. If a person wants a double, triple A finish, then they're put back together and hand sanded with thousand grit and oil until they get a nice sheen and all the pores are filled. This is the area where the final gun's assembled, inspected, and final tag before it gets shipped out of here to its new customer. And when you get done, this is what your final product is. Every gun is different. Base price for a Shallow Sharps rifle is $1,900. People start putting a lot of gold and platinum in them. It'll go, you know, 10, 12,000. While some of these guns go up on a wall and will never be fired, a growing number of men and women of all ages compete with these rifles in long range target shooting, firing at targets more than 800 yards away, using nothing more than the old iron sights of the 1800s. It's different, it's uh, history, it's not, uh... When you're shooting, it's not like going out with the high-powered scopes and, and everything. When you hit a target at 500 yards with iron sights and it goes down, you get a little excited because it's just, I mean, it's iron sights. Kirk and Lucinda, brother and sister, both enjoy competing when they can. But it's just the fun because Kirk is my spotter. I shoot, I spot, he shoots, and so it's kind of a, if he does well and you're spotting, I mean, it's a, it's a team effort. So you feel good at the end of the day if he comes out and gets first, second place. You just feel like you accomplished something. I shot these photos for a magazine story at the annual Matthew Quigley Buffalo Rifle Match outside Forsyth, Montana. The latest competition attracted more than 600 shooters from 37 states and four foreign countries. Well, all over the United States. You can uh, anymore pretty much shoot anywhere every weekend. The guns are used for hunting as well, including modern day buffalo hunting. But like most things out west, the best part of it all are the people you meet. Just the people that we meet all over the world, my brother and I, and my mom and dad, we, you know, my brother and I travel to the shows, we shoot together as a team, and I think it's just kind of that, our kids grew up that way with us, they set targets, it's, it's been a neat way of life. Lucinda and her brother run Shiloh Sharps with their semi-retired parents, mom still works in the office, and dad still helps out in the shop. So. And it's a family business. We work all day together and we play at nights. <laughs> business is good. Shiloh has a year's worth of backlogged orders. When the doors close, 
we're family. When we're here, it's business. And a unique business it is, recreating a piece of history from the Old West. A good pair of boots are a tool of the trade for the working cowboy. And for some, there's nothing like a handmade pair from Idaho working cowboy, Seth Tykert. I love it. I love the finished product when it turns out right. In the garage of a home on a windswept cattle ranch outside Mackey, Idaho, you'll find the custom boot shop of cowboy Seth Tykert. I'm not in it for really the money. It's a fun hobby for me. It's not like he needs a hobby to fill his time. Seth is a married father of four children, runs a working cattle ranch, spends hours volunteering at his church, enjoys hunting and sports shooting, but just for fun, builds custom cowboy boots. I can't sit around and do nothing. Sitting down watching TV bores me. Um, I can't sit around. I have to be doing something. When he has to spare a moment, which isn't too often, he heads to the garage to build boots, the old school way, handmade and stitched together with vintage equipment. These machines here are, are the finishers. This is the buffer. I don't know a year on these, but they're very old. I'm guessing 30s, probably 1930s. This is a sole stitcher. Uh, big heavy machine weighs about 800 pounds and it'll stitch through the sole and the welt of a boot. Difficult to run. This thing kind of runs the shop. It's, it's the boss of the shop. It's a 1929 is when it was made. A little Singer 3115. Stitches like it's brand new. The old machines feel good and they don't cost as much money. <laughs> it all started by accident. I liked playing with leather. I always knew that. I liked just doing little leather projects and I was searching for a leather sewing machine. I call the guy, he says, I'm actually a boot repair shop. Long story short, I ended up buying the shop. The working cowboy had long been buying his own boots from a custom boot shop in Dubois, Idaho, run by Stephen Bev Gilger. So I told them I bought a boot repair shop and they said, well, what are you gonna do with the machines? I said, that's a great question, I don't know. And they offered me a paid apprenticeship. Newly married, Seth and his bride moved into the apartment above the boot shop where he spent the next seven months learning the craft of building boots. Great experience, learned a lot. They're still good friends today. We still talk, they just, they still coach me along and help me. Fast forward a couple of years and Seth is managing the ranch in Mackey, but still working on boots, learning through seminars, classes, and videos. And after lots of trial and error, he finally started getting the hang of it. That's kind of how I got my start, just here at the ranch in the evenings as I had time, I'd go fiddle with boots. and. Um, got to where I was pretty comfortable with it and started taking some orders and the orders have kind of taken off. A lot of people call an order and it's quite a process starting with what's known as a last. You shape it to the person's foot off of the foot measurements, build up with leather where you need to to, to shape that foot and then you, you build the boot around that. Then you have to cut the custom design leather pattern for the upper part of the boot. What I'll do is I make a cardboard pattern of, and I'd use his foot measurements. And then I cut out my top pattern. So I'm gonna cut this cross out in gray and put it on the, on the top here and then he wants red stitching around that. And so it's gonna be a black, gray, and red pair of boots. He, he's very particular on what he wants. When it's all sewn together, the boot gets mounted on the last. This pair right here is for a local rancher, uh, one of the neighbors. This will be his second pair. This is a matching pair to his first pair. Water buffalo bottoms and a kangaroo top. Um, it's at the stage it was just recently lasted. It's still wet. Seth uses lemon wood pegs to mount the boot instead of nails. Your boots are going to get wet out working. That's just the long and the short of it. These will swell, tighten the boot, less chance of leaking dirt. A nail will rust, cause a little bit bigger hole and over time they start to let go when you start getting dirt leaking in and water leaking in. Then comes the welt. There's this part here. That's, that goes around and that's what the sole will sole to. Seth calls good quality material the key to a well-built boot. This is the insole I use, a good thick leather insole. And a lot of, a lot of boots are still made with these and you look for that. Um, really helps the longevity of a boot. You wind up with beautiful handcrafted custom boots that fit and last but they're not cheap, typically $1,200 to $2,000 a pair. And I've had people that have questioned me on boots. I'd like a pair of boots and they hear 650, their jaw hits the floor. They're, they're really, really amazed at what they cost. But for a working cowboy, expensive well-made boots are actually cheaper. The lifespan you get out of a pair of, of custom or handmade boots is so much longer than a pair of factory boots that you can just buy off the shelf at a store. Uh, and that's how you justify that price. If you're one of Seth's children, boots are free, 
when you turn three. And that's their own. We don't pass them down to the next kid. That's their boot that I just, I hope they keep the rest of their lives and go, that was my first pair from dad. It takes about 40 hours for Seth to build a pair of boots, even longer for the fancier ones. So a thousand bucks or more, which of course includes the cost of materials, isn't much profit. That is a lot of money for a working cowboy, but a good pair of boots is a critical tool of the trade for the guys who make their living on the back of a horse. And working cowboys, they'll spend money on saddles, on headgear for a horse, on boots, things that they need to have good. You can go buy a, a factory saddle also, and they don't last, they don't hold up. You get a bull rope, you break the tree. What good was that? You saved money on the purchase price, but you lost money in the long run. Working cowboys are his main clientele, and there's nothing more satisfying than a satisfied customer. I love it. Go to a branding and there's six or eight pair of my boots running around the branding. It's neat to see that and they're, they're holding up. And nobody's cussing at me too bad because they hurt their feet. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you want a pair of Seth's boots, you're out of luck, at least for now. The waiting list is so long, four and a half years, that he's quit taking orders. But for those lucky enough to snag a pair, they're worth the wait. Yeah, it takes a long time. I'm about 40 hours in a plain pair of boots like this. You get into some of the fancier boots, there's more time, but the end products, if you take your time and do each step right, and I think that would apply to about anything in life. If you do each step correctly, you're going to end up with the product you like. That's it for now. We're back next time with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. I'm Mark Bedore. We'll see you down the trail. For more information on the people and places featured in today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com.